Welcome to today's episode of Inside Startup Investing. On this episode, you will be hearing from Mike Gugat, co-founder and CEO of Jaybirds. If you have ever struggled with foot pain and spent time trying to find the right shoe for yourself, this just might be the episode for you. More importantly, if you are a parent with small children, you will absolutely want to hear more about Jaybirds. Some of the highlights that I took away from talking with Mike included that one, Mike has assembled an incredible team around him to build a new age shoe company for the children's segment. Anyone who knows apparel and footwear knows entering these categories with behemoths like Nike and Adidas is not for the faint of heart. But with Mike's 20 plus years of working for major shoe brands, along with bringing on doctors and folks who've worked in key roles at major shoe brands, I think he and his team are much more poised than most founding teams would be to take on industry stalwarts like that. Second, I want you to listen to their unique go-to-market approach that emphasizes certain active lifestyle consumer segments as a way to prove demand for their shoes. I've never heard of finding kids' shoes in high-end running stores, but for Jaybirds, it actually makes a ton of sense. And lastly, I never really thought about it before this episode, but Mike dives into why creating shoes for little kids from their first steps actually elicits quite an emotional reaction from customers, an attachment to the brand for them as well. I really think this can help them build strong brand loyalty and repeat purchases. So with that, let's get on to the show and welcome Mike. So Mike, thank you very much for joining us today. Chris, thank you for having me. Absolutely. First off, give us the one-liner of what Jaybirds is all about. So Jaybirds is, is really about anatomically correct footwear that is cute. And uh, I'll expand if you, but you know, I'll let you keep asking questions. Awesome. You, you've created this company, Jaybirds. Now, what I'd love to hear is a little bit about how it is that you decided to found this company and what's your background? What led you here? So actually, my, the background is what led me here. And uh, I had worked in the footwear industry ever since I was a freshman in college. I uh, had delusions of playing basketball in college, wasn't quick enough, wasn't good enough, but I got talked into playing rugby. And most all the sports I'd played up to that date, uh, running had been punishment. And so I was I was required to bear, buy a pair of running shoes to actually train for rugby and uh, ended up getting offered a full-time job selling running shoes while I was in college. And that ended up leading to, you know, a 20-year career in the sporting goods industry, working for brands like Mizuno and Adidas. And while at Adidas, I had always had this entrepreneurial spirit. I, I believe that there are very good caretakers in the corporate world. They, they try to leave things better than they found them. Uh, but to be a founder is that opportunity to, to really build something and, and work with people, not necessarily for people. And so I'd gotten a phone call from a, a very large retailer, direct consumer business in Baltimore called Hollibird Sports. And David Hirschfeld, who's m one of my co-founders now, called me up and he says, hey, I've got a friend, longtime foot and ankle surgeon, 30 years with the Baltimore Orioles. He was with his grandson and he has this insight around making better kids shoes, would you meet with them? And I said, I'll meet with them, but I'm a little, you know, you know, I have reservations because footwear is, is sort of a red ocean. You have established brands, the barrier to enter is, is very high. And so when I met with the doctor, we were standing in a 15,000 square foot showroom with all the brands you can think of, Nike, Adidas, Hoka, on. And the doctor explains what he wants to do. And I held up a pair of Pilates socks and I held up a pair of Adidas Boost shoes I had been intimately involved in launching. And I said, if these two things, you know, could have a baby, then I'd be interested. I don't want to make shoes with laces. I don't want to do. So anyway, I was looking over his shoulder at 50,000 square feet of distribution space. Uh, and I said, let's go ask uh, David if he'll be our partner. So Dr. Jay LeBeau, a longtime doctor with the Orioles and David, we, we became a partnership and it dawned on us that, you know, most of the shoes, kind of the dirty little secret of the industry, most of the shoes are miniaturized versions of adult hmm. shoes or they're ill-fitting foot coverings. I like to joke, some of which can be eaten by escalators. But um, so in that, he made me realize that having dealt with professional athletes, but also everyday people, many of the problems that they have or that he would treat could have been prevented between cradle and eight years old. Eight years old is about the time when the foot is fully developed. Mm -hmm. So that then sort of bred this mission of, can we start kids off on the right foot 
and a vision can walking become running and running is core to play. So we're on this journey to really become an active lifestyle brand for not just kids as they graduate, but also reconnecting new parents with uh, their own fitness and wellness. All right. Now you hit on one of the things, which is, you know, these shoes could be anatomically better for, for children and help them live these active lifestyles. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about what it is that makes this shoe unique to be able to help with those exact type of issues? Absolutely. So right around, you know, nine months, kids start to pull up and, uh, and right about a year, they actually get a, a bone develops called a cuboid. And it's actually on the lateral side of the foot. And of course, the doctor would better explain this. But as that develops, it serves as the fulcrum to the tendons that actually help baby stand, balance, and ultimately walk. Mm. And if you're taking an adult shoe and shrinking it down for a kid's foot that's already developed, you're actually giving a kid an arch inside a shoe that doesn't need an arch. Mm. You're also, you know, the contour of the heel of that shoe is that for an developed adult foot. So it's also shortening their Achilles tendon. And so there's a number of things that are happening, whereas if we really try to mimic baby being barefoot, you know, a zero drop where they're flat to the ground. I realize we're not on video, but I'll use this, you know, as we're talking that, you know, a zero drop shoes. So they're flat to the ground. So we don't shorten the Achilles. And then we've actually done like a real suede on the outsole, mm. which mimics almost like the skin of the foot. So it's just enough grip. So baby won't trip. And so they have a sweeping gait. And it's, you know, just coming up with design elements that are that are really thoughtful. And that's what Dr. Jay LeBeau had, has done. Now, I, I believe you had mentioned it, it may have been uh, Dr. Jay LeBeau or, or someone else that uh, they had a nephew or, or a grandchild that had an issue. Is there a common issue that arises in children from kind of wearing these ill-fitting shoes? They sort of happen later in life, mm. you know, but, but as they're wearing them. The thing that it was his grandson and his grandson had come into his office and the declination of the, the shoes the grandson was in, the heel was higher than the forefoot. And so his kid was really tripping. Hmm. And then they were very ill-fitting. So it, it was almost like it was more laborious for his grandson to move around in these shoes. But nowadays, and if you have kids, you know this, that you know in most childcare situations, as early as six months, they have to wear shoes. And so finding a shoe that's easy to get on and that will stay on, you know, was one of the other you know, elements of this that we, we really wanted to, you know, address. Yeah. And now I, I know not everyone will be watching a video, um, but the, the shoe that you showed one, it, it has a really nice design to it too. It does kind of remind me of those kind of Nike slip on uh, more barefoot type shoes. Um, so when people are looking at the category, right, obviously there's tons of children's shoes. How do you cut through the noise and get people to understand that a, this issue exists, and B, we could help solve it. Yeah, and I think that it's, it's that process, right? You have an insight. You need to credential that insight. I'm doing that right now, being able to talk to you. And then I think that the next, you know, sort of phase of that is is what is that sort of stunt or moment where, you know, parents can have that aha moment. And there are a lot of really good children's brands out there, you know, right now that are that are looking to address it. We kind of feel like most of them are focused on lifestyle, where we are really focused on sort of performance and athletic and movement and, and wellness, um, so that we, we see that as, as really our opportunity. But it is a combination of one part, you know, showing up where new moms are, and then the other is sort of going against the grain. So as we look to add retailers, we're not going into baby boutiques where there's already a bunch of, you know, these shoes we're actually going to run specialty stores mm. where, you know, these retailers are fitting mom postpartum where her foot has changed and she needs a new pair of hokas or ons. They now have something to offer baby. And there's that sentimentality of that first, you know, moment. So those, those are some of the, you know, uh, ways we're going about it that uh, we, we really want to treat this as a blue ocean opportunity. Now talk to me a little bit about actually developing the product because, you know, I would say shoes, in some, especially when you're creating these unique designs, there's a lot that goes into it from a manufacturing and design standpoint. So how are you doing that? What have been some of the challenges in kind of developing and getting this shoe manufactured? That's a great question. And, and it's funny, one of our investors was the one-time president of Bostonian Footwear. Mm. 
and uh, a friend of Dr. Jay LeBeau's, and he used to tease the doctor, you know, nobody starts footwear companies, you're out of your mind, the cost of the molds, all of those things, you know, are, are again, the barrier to enter. And uh, he became an investor after he saw that we were able to, you know, make the product and, and, and sell the product. Um, but to back up, uh, we started out on this adventure leveraging many of the relationships I had working at Adidas and other places. We went to, uh, you know, as, as much of the manufacturing that used to exist here got offshored. Uh, we went to places like Vietnam and China and Mexico, and we were striking out because the minimum order quantities were so high for a startup like ours and as three founders, you know, bootstrapping this. Um, and then funny enough, we had a conversation with an entrepreneur that had been in the footwear space for 40 years. And that person had actually recently exited uh, Kodiak Boots. He'd sold Kodiak Boots to the VF Corporation. And then he uh, retirement didn't suit him. So he uh, decided to start a pickleball line of shoes, but phoned him just before the pandemic. And he said to me, years ago, I owned the license on Oshkosh Bagosh footwear. And, and they used to call these granny grabbers, just cute shoes the grandmothers would buy for their kids. And he said, somebody came to me with the idea of putting lights in shoes. And I was like, that sounds really gimmicky. But I know these guys out in California. He introduced them to what then became Skechers wow. and minted them. He said, you're actually looking to help kids. I want to help you. So he became our sourcing and development partner. Our designer was somebody I'd worked with at Mizuno long time award-winning running shoe designer had worked at Mizuno and Under Armour. And then uh, my other partner that I mentioned earlier, you know, for 40 years has been one of the top mail order and e-commerce businesses in the running tennis and fitness space. And so we had a fulfillment partner. And so we, you know, what should have taken, you know, two weeks of being in the factory and iterating over samples during COVID ended up taking almost two years a lot of FedExing, a lot of waiting, a lot of, you know, lost in translation over Zoom. But we launched in July of 2022 and have sold several thousand pairs of shoes. Today. Wow. Where have the sales been coming from? Is it direct to consumer? Is it in these kind of specialty running shops? So direct to consumer. And so we actually uh, the just are starting to venture into retail. Uh, we actually exhibited at one of the biggest trade shows for the running and walking uh, industry that also includes kind of the outdoor space uh, called the running event down in Austin, Texas. And that was the week before last. And there we, uh, in a really cool uh, uh, way, we, we not only connected with retailers that saw this as a potential growth category, as many of the big brands traditionally don't get behind the kids' business, even though the unit economics are really great. Um, and then we had a number of international distributors who were there at the show who also expressed interest. So we're, we're working through a lot of those exploratory conversations right now. Now, on that front, you know, I know in the kind of CPG category, a lot of times it's you start with direct to consumer to show the numbers. And then once you have enough numbers that says you have velocity, then the stores will look at you and that's how you start getting on the shelves. Um, is that the same thing in the shoe category or is it really just impressing the right buyer to be excited about having this new unique offering in their store? You know, it, I think you're, you're, you're right on in, in footwear in general. Um, the kid space has always been interesting again, because you, 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 you have an audience that is sort of attentive to it for, you know, that period of cradle to eight years old. And in that period of time, the, the first purchases are really about the parents and their sentimentality. And about, you know, three to five year olds, kids start to embrace color and sparkles and other things. So they start to influence the choice mm. within, say, a brand. And by eight, kids are starting to recognize brands. So what we kind of saw with this was is we needed to prove to investors that we could make and sell shoes and, and do it, you know, uh, well. Um, and then to retailers, it's been, you know, more of that blue ocean approach of, Let's go somewhere where we can stand alone, but we know mothers are shopping and we know new families are shopping. And so that's why we, we have really leaned into where my relationships existed in this running and walking specialty space. What about the challenge of with, with children? As I mentioned early on in the discussion, you know, they grow so fast and their, their feet are constantly changing in size, which I imagine creates a need for a lot of SKUs, right? Uniquely sized products. Um, which then in, in thinking about inventory management and demand and all of that, is there certain sizes? How are you managing the complexity of having so many sizes that are needed within children? 
It's such a great question. And I think going back to kind of the direct consumer thing, I remember the founder of American Giant talking about being in sort of a perpetual sellout, you know, or out of inventory for the first four years of, you know, building his business. And, you know, so for us in, in managing that is, is we've designed and developed the shoes based on physical developmental milestones. So the first one is stand to walk. The next one's walk to run. Uh, and then it'll be run to play. And then within that, we've overlapped the sizes as all kids kind of grow, you know, differently. So we'll actually introduce our second model uh, uh, next year. And uh, with that, that'll get us up to about three years of age. And then there's other ways in which we can start to address width and uh, uh, other anatomical needs. In terms of what the consumers look like to date, has there been kind of a target demographic, you know, you mentioned kind of the active lifestyle individual going into a running store. Is a certain type of person that this is really resonating with? There's a couple that really stand out to me. So like we've shipped shoes to every state in the union. We've, uh, um, you know, we've had a, a lot of different interests, but I'd say there's, there's a third of our customer uh, base that are actually grandparents. And in many respects, like they don't want their grandkids to have the aches and pains they now have. <laughs> so they see that benefit of investing in their feet. Um, and then there's, you know, I think there's that first time mom who just wants to be as informed as possible. And, and, you know, there's a bit of a badge that comes with having something that somebody else doesn't have. Or, you know, again, if that, that insight, you know, resonates with them. And then the, the other third that's been really interesting to see is sort of the, um, uh, uh, you know, Hispanic and Latino community where footwear, you know, at this age is, is of real importance. And so, you know, we've, we've started to, you know, cut some of our, our ads in, in Spanish and, uh, you know, have seen a real benefit there. And, and so, yeah, we're every day it's sort of unearthed something new or there's a signal that, you know, maybe we, we hadn't thought of that uh, presents an opportunity. Well, something that I've uh, really found kind of fascinating since becoming a parent and being around other parents too, is um, the level of influence that, you know, the mom blogs and parent influencers and TikTok folks have on buying decisions across all of the category. I mean, everything for uh, from a baby, you know, through when they're eight or 10 years old. Um, are you playing in that market at all? How do you even get there? I, it, like, how do you, you target influencers? I'm, I'm curious to hear if you've leveraged that at all. I always smile because like traditionally, you know, this would be a mompreneur that is bringing this business forth. And, you know, my two partners are grandfathers and I like to joke in some states I might be old enough to be a grandfather. <laughs> um, and and so, you know, I get to sit on the fence of old and new as, as we approach these things. And so there's what's what's really interesting is the number of mom groups, whether they're private Facebook groups whether they're, uh, you know, more coordinated listservs in different areas. I live on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., and we have this Mothers on the Hill moth that's, you know, you know it's got 50,000 moms, and it's, it's amazing that communication that goes on. But you're right about that, that peer influence. So we've, we've been very strategic in, in finding ways to partner with moms, and we kind of feel like in some cases when we can sponsor the first pair – you know, then the retention, you know, comes thereafter. So I should give my wife credit here because when we started on this adventure, we were having our first child and, uh, and just the, the amount that moms carry of information and the things that they, you know, go through to find the very best for their kids. Uh, she's also a commercial director and filmmaker. So not only did she help with many of those insights as far as the, our visual presentation, both in video and, uh, and, uh, you know, our photo assets all go through her lens. I love that. That's really cool. When you think about growth levers for the business, where do you see driving growth over, call it the next 12 to 24 months? Yeah, so I, I think, it, you know, for us, it is doubling down on the, the, the paid and, and earned media. Um, and, you know, just given our, you know, collectively, when I look at it from concept to delivered good, we have almost 300 years of, of collective, you know, footwear, marketing, uh, uh, branding expertise. And so we're right now working, you know, to figure out some of these partnerships that will allow us to really find the right micro influencers and have them graduate as their kids are graduating through these physical developmental milestones. So we definitely see that as being a big opportunity. And then obviously the, the, the retail, 
and um, international, you know, peace would uh, certainly help us on the, you know, uh, manufacturing front as well. Like that, that volume will help us with minimums and those minimums, you know, you know, will make it more affordable to us to be able to add these other products. So as you mentioned, the velocity, now we're, you know, it's becoming less costly to, you know, acquire the customers if we're graduating the customers to, you know, other products. So you're, you're raising uh, funds right now. Can you tell us how you're planning to deploy them kind of against your key initiatives? Yeah, so kind of twofold. Um, one, one nice thing is, is I, I was joking with an investor, like I'll never run for office on a platform that I created a bunch of jobs because there's just, there's so much amazing new technology out there to kind of a work from that concept of delivered good. And so, you know, for us, it's really how do we, you know, double down on the marketing to create that velocity, but at the same time on the, the product itself, enhance it, make it better, but also add those other products that will get us up to eight years old. And then bigger vision is, is the, the money we're raising right now, you know, is to serve as a bridge to where then, you know, if we get to that place where we can scale, is then we truly kind of, you know, blow up this play category and that becomes a true running shoe. That becomes a cleated shoe for, you know, kids for soccer or a court shoe as they embrace basketball or volleyball. So that that's that's the big vision. But you've mentioned that you've already sold kind of thousands of shoes. Um, what has been some of the feedback? What have been the most positive points? It's a combination of, you know, these are really cute. I've never seen anything like this they won't take them off. Like it's, it's a confidence or they, you know, I, I got an email just the other night from a mom who said, I, I'm buying more shoes because my daughter took her first steps in your shoes and what a moment that was. But then like immediately it went from taking first steps to actually running in the <laughs> shoes where like, you know, if they were wearing ill fitting, you know, foot coverings or for that matter, shoes that were miniaturized adult shoes, Sometimes they don't have that confidence because they're actually having to carry around, you know, a lot more material. I know we talked a little bit about it, but talk to me a, a little more about kind of the unit economics as you start to scale this up. Where does it become, you know, gross profitable? And then what do you think about scale in terms of being able to get to profitability? I've got a really amazing CFO advisor who I've known for 20 years. I met him when he was at Wharton and uh, he had the fortune of having a number of professors that worked on like the away bag and War Warby Parker and things like that. But his name's Samuel Asuri and he uh, is a full-time finance guy at Warner Brothers. Um, but he, you know, helped us sort of model this based on that bass adoption model. So like, again, as we graduate, you know, customer to customer. So we're, we're, you know, we, we believe that we can get to profitability in the next 24 to 36 months. Um, that being said, the unit economics, uh, we had validated by the FDRA, which is the footwear developers and retail association. And I like to joke that, you know, along the way in this project, you know, I've met so many different people that just in unexpected ways, but my neighbor's head of government relations for the FDRA. And, you know, not the typical DC, you meet somebody, who do you work for? What do you do? Turns out our kids played together. We never got to that. And somebody said, how are the shoes coming, Mike? And he's like, wait, what? You make footwear? <laughs> this is what I do. So he was able to help us with logistics and other things, but he volunteered as his economist. Because I had heard a statistic that by the age of six, kids have had 36 pairs oh of shoes. Oh, my God. So although the total addressable market doesn't seem huge, you know, in the U.S., you got about 4 million babies being born every year. That addressable market is, you know, six to eight pair per year because then you factor in rain boots and and you know, uh, seasonal like sandals and, and then the foot growing as quickly as it is, as you mentioned. So, so we're, we're, we're pretty bullish that the unit economics are in our favor. Here. And will you look across all the, as you mentioned, kind of like the, the rain boots and all of that, will you do all these different types of SKUs or are you going to kind of stay focused on the athletic shoe? We're entertaining all of it as long as we can do it in an anatomically correct way. So as long as we can take our last knowing that it's what's best for baby at that stage of their development and growth and build around that, like we're, everything's on the table in that sense. Last question for you here. What does success look like uh, for Jaybirds over, call it the next 12 to 24 months? 
kind of short term is is being able to raise the the this this bridge round, if you will, through WeFunder. Um, and then, you know, with that, that sets us up with enough runway to actually drive enough revenue to get us to hopefully then an A round. And then with that A round, then, you know, that's where we can scale by, you know, adding these products and sort of, you know, really uh, delivering against the vision. Love it. Well, Mike, this has been such a terrific conversation. Thank you so much for what you're building. Um, for those who are interested in investing, you can go to WeFunder and check them out. Uh, I think this is a really unique story and an exciting business. So thank you very, very much again for being on the show today. 